Welcome to the Design YouTube channel. I'm Hugh, and today's video is part of a webinar series. Get ready for an engaging session ahead that will probably give you a lot of new information. Thank you, and hope you enjoy the video. I want to thank you, first of all, for being here to this uh, presentation about AI art versus uh, the artists today. Can generative AI replace the human artist? So we're going to try to address this question as deeply as possible and see like what are the general concerns, what are, the, what are the things going on, and we will actually delve into each topic and actually expand on it a bit. We'll start with the general outline of this presentation. So what happened with generative AI art and what type of strides it happened or, or what strides it made in 2022, 2023. There was a conversation back in uh, 2022, I don't know if you remember that in 2023, this is going to be a huge problem, it's going to replace a lot of people and so on and so forth. There was a prediction that a lot of people made uh, on uh, across YouTube channels and uh, there were a lot of conversation and controversy around it where now we're in 2024 that didn't happen in 2023 and I will mainly explain like why certain things didn't happen and what is going to come together so in this this component here we'll share our thoughts how AI art can impact working artists from a practical perspective so we always have this thought behind practicality Meaning these thoughts are limited by what the what we currently know about this domain, which is, is still rapidly evolving as we speak. And of course, there's not a definitive outlook on the future, like meaning that you cannot like pinpoint and stamp like, oh, this is the future. Now we know everything about it. But we will reflect on certain areas and of course, different perspectives. Of course, you probably saw a, a bunch of people discussing about this topic online as well through various blogs and uh, various like uh, types of content, including podcasts. And of course, we will see what the future may look for artists in the era of generative AI. And we have a couple of things here. In the first part, we'll talk about generative AI and we'll talk about like intro to generative AI, use cases in games and film, challenges, and of course, regulation, because it's starting to become pretty regulated. And of course, in the second part, we'll talk about the generative AI art and AI art, what is the, the biggest lack of this? Uh, what is involved in making uh, art of course, creators and consumers of art, and of course, some practical steps when it comes to you as an artist at an individual level and cer certain things you can do to actually protect yourself and certain things you can understand of what you can move uh, forward. In the intro part, we need to address ourselves what is generative AI. Generative AI is the artificial intelligence capable of generating text, images, sound, or video based on prompts. This here, text inputs. And we're gonna talk a bit about the text inputs because they have limitations too. Uh, this is not the same as procedural generated content, which uh, uses algorithms to create content based on predefined inputs, meaning there's an algorithm behind it that will basically build, build these predefined inputs. How does this actually work? So you got the training DI here, where it uses extensive image sets with descriptions, which are called data sets. Of course, it goes to the artificial neural network. It identifies the patterns and learns about subjects, concepts, and styles through like a method of text, which, you know, it's a method of association. There's a, a trial and error process, and then it, it defines what is a stone, what is an apple, and so on and so forth. And now this is the user uses a text prompt. It, the text prompt is translated into a numerical representation. So the, the text prompt is basically creating coordinates in space, mainly for the individual to actually create those things. Those coordinates are, you know, kind of pinpointing what point in space is being defined, and of course, the output image is being created on a previous training interpretation of the current prompt and that creates the image output. First of all, you'll see that these are from different articles here. You'll be able to access through the document these articles, but let's go to understanding what, what, uh, what are these text prompts. Okay, so uh, what is NLP model is, which is natural language processing. It's a machine learning technology that gives computers the ability to interpret, manipulate, and understand the human language, either text or speech. And of course, the contrastive language image pre-trained, the clip component, a neural network trained on a predict the correct um, pairings between images and text. It basically recognizes visual concepts and images based on their text descriptions. So these are the some, some very important components where, where we understand text prompts. And of course, generating images. So the, the GAN, or the Generative Adversarial Networks, Basically, this is where machine learning algorithms based on two competing neural networks. So there's like both one is a, a general term and a discriminator. So one generates, the other one discriminates. They try to kind of fight with each other in the process to learn and improve. That's kind of like it's like people having debates to improve each other and contextualizing certain types of information to actually get better at it. So that's a, it's some, a similar way like how we learn in some ways from each other. 
So that's what they're trying to do. So these uh, generators are trying to compare information and actually make that happen in a manner that uh, actually gets to a certain result. And of course, then you have the diffusion models where you have machine learning models that learn through a training process of progressively adding Gaussian noise to labeled images and removing noise to recreate the original image. So what this does basically, um, in essence, is basically it decomposes an image and then recomposes it. So the learnings were to attach, you know, the diffusion uh, itself to actually generate the image itself. Now, the neural style transfer, the NST, is a deep learning application that fuses the content of an image with the style of another image to create a new image. So, uh, and we have a small little example here with the uh, cute corgi and of course, like the water lilies from Claude Monet. This is uh, based on a uh, presentation from the guys from Altexsoft, which are explaining like how these things are, uh, are, are working. And of course, um, this is pretty much what we, we got here. Now let's see some use cases in video uh, games and film. Here we got a, a couple of co companies. We got Square Enix, which uh, created some in-game soundtrack album artwork for Foam Stars, uh, remasters the Partopia Serial Murder Case game in 2023. We got Wizard of the Coast, which created a promo art for Magic the Gathering. This was a controversy on Twitter. I think you guys know about it, and if you don't, you can check it out. Uh, and the Dungeon and Dragons Sourcebook, both allegedly unintentional. I don't believe it was unintentional necessarily, but that's what they say. Um, Activision Blizzard has some AR powered system to generate music unique to each player. So they're trying to do that. Square Enix, uh, Waymark, uh, 12 uh, AI film, The Frost, individual Asian frames animated through AI. So that's what they try to do. In essence, what you have to understand from this, this gives me an insight here just off the bat that people are utilizing like in studios these type of tools to generate you know certain things for certain specific tasks so they're trying to add specificity to it because it doesn't have that now when it comes to like the areas where it will uh, kind of affect it will have in-game and promo art maybe music and sound remastering and creating new works npc behavior scripts and dialogue uh, world and environment characters and uh, coding texturing and of course, here we got Mark Microsoft that partnered with an in-world AI to develop AI and PC to support more player-driven narratives. We got NVIDIA that has Avatar Cloud Engine uh, demo showcase an NPC with AI-based dialogue and facial animations. And of course, Ubisoft is testing Ghostwriter, which is an in-house tool for first draft NPC dialogue. This is very specific here is first draft NPC dialogue. Why? Because like at the, at the end of the day, there's somebody there to tweak those dialogues and those conversations to make them more palatable towards the consumer. So you still need people to actually make that uh, worthwhile. Now you'll have Square Enix, which backed Atlas, a, a 3D generative AI platform for building game worlds. You got Blizzard testing a Blizzard diffusion in-house tool for concept art and in-game character renderings. NVIDIA, which partnered with uh, Masterpiece Studio for Masterpiece X, aiming to create AI-generated 3D models. And of course, Roblox generated a code assist automating basic uh, coding tasks and material generated creating textures from prompts in 2023. So this is pretty much the state of what we kind of found out about like what's going on in the industry and what you guys can pay attention to and take some notes on this because like these areas here are currently being affected by the uh, AI tendency. Now, we're going to go into the next topic where we're talking about the generative AI challenges. And this is the first part of it too. And of course, here, uh, generative AI itself will, will come with dif uh, different challenges and certain type of questions. And we have a list here on the ethical side and technical side. Uh, and of course, this is not exhaustive, like this is not limited to what you see here. Um, first, we need to define what ethics means and what technical means. And of course, ethics is about moral principles that govern people's behavior. Uh, the branch of knowledge that deals with moral principles. And of course, technical is literally regarding limitations in the area of software, hardware, and processes, workflows, pipelines, and many other things regarding that, uh, that area. Now, on the ethical side, uh, companies that operate on for-profit basis uh, will have things such as uh, uh, ethics is not their focus and AI may, may be profitable tool. So that's what they're thinking, of course. Um, so there is no ethical consideration on behalf of uh, a lot of companies because they're thinking of this as a tool that actually creates a process that actually makes things easier for them on the long run. Uh, there is potentially harmful content and deepfakes. And this is a, a more dangerous area, I would say, 
which uh, limited ability to control the outcome and uses of AI art, meaning that there, there will be bad actors in, in, uh, in different contexts and even in society. An ethical data collection where artworks are often scrapped without author's consent, uh, basically like most people call it stealing, and that's absolutely correct. And this is a real problem because like there, there are people uh, scrapping artists' artwork. We've seen that um, happening. We saw Carla Ortiz doing a talk about it. We saw Greg Rutkowski going about it as well. And the entire scenario actually uh, exploded. But this also pushed people to think about regulation, which is absolutely great. And certain authorities are thinking about regulating this area more and more. Now, when it comes to like uh, artist pushback, where is AI proofing art? So there, there are literally softwares that appear, such as Nightshade or Glaze, that claims to invisibly alter images to be misclassified by AI models. So, for example, you paint a cat, the, the software itself will label it as a dog, in essence. So it's actually going to mess up if someone tries to type in, I want a dog, but it'll give him a cat, you know, that, that's like how they'll alter it. And they can alter it in a, even in a more profound way, like you um, you ask for clouds and it gives you grass, that type of thing. Uh, you ask for a feather, it gives you a potato. So that's kind of like what it, what it does, and that's a pretty interesting technology. And I think this will evolve even more, and I think artists will be using this more and more over time. And I believe that will start to generate some, some very strong pushback at a collective level in this sector. Uh, when it comes to liability, when not disclosing AI was used. So now with potential reputation implications. And here regarding like artists that do use AI technology, but they don't mention that they used it, um, can have some uh, reputation implications. As you guys know, um, you can copyright an image if it's roughly like 70% um, done by you, like even photo bashing needs to be altered to a matter of 70% at least. And the images that are used in the photo bashing need to be licensed. So that's, that's a thing uh, for the Copyright uh, Protection Act. Now, when it comes to like the, 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 the similar thing here, uh, if you use AI, you probably have to alter that image in a proportion of 70%, like meaning like, even if it's something cool that you like off the bat, you need to alter it in a profound way and that becomes harder and harder to alter something at the at least 70% level. It has to look nothing like the, the previous generated image that you had uh, uh, at the beginning. Now there's a demotivation that can be an ethical concern as well, where uh, this is in more of a, a conversation about like fear that can deter people from actually learning. So when, when you're afraid and you don't know what's gonna happen, you will uh, be concerned. And being concerned will put you continuously on a sort of like, what if, why should I do this if this is gonna be the end of it? Why should I do X, Y, Z if that's gonna, you know, gonna F up my life and so on and so forth. So there's a, there's a, there's a sort of like uh, this idea that if you, if you're afraid, let's keep people afraid so they actually don't learn more, pretty much. And uh, I think that's this is happening at a more profound collective level than we think about, and it affects everybody. Um, I I suggest people not to be afraid in essence because like uh, if you're gonna be afraid, it's not gonna actually change a lot of things. Sometimes it's good to be afraid because it can change things too. So being afraid sometimes is helpful because it can self preserve you uh, in certain scenarios. But uh, you know in this scenario, I think we should actually keep our heads on heads on the shoulders so we can actually navigate these waters um, at the end of the day. And these are some of the ethical implication. Um, from a technical standpoint, there's a lack of transparency, like how, uh, you know, non-open source algorithms work, lack of integration with different pipelines and workflows, um, flaws in rendering elements, and uh, what happens there is like uncanny elements, uh, issues with certain fine details, certain problems with human faces, uh, you saw the hands thingy, and so on and so forth, like there are multiple flaws there, and most of the people, even today, they can recognize what is an AI-generated image compared to one that is created by an artist. Usually artists can provide a workflow to their image, like how they actually achieve that, in essence, uh, to showcase it with public, and uh, that shouldn't be a problem. There is a problem with computational power, and this is a real problem. I had a conversation with uh, uh, a tech guy, he's really capable, and we asked him like, what do you think is the biggest problem or the biggest thing on the technical side? And he told me that computational power is definitely a, an issue. And there isn't yet sufficient computation power to account for all variables involved in art, for example. And there's an inherent reliance on text prompts. While not all creative aspects can be reduced to language, of course, um, 
because art will have a specific language to work with and that is the language of lighting language of color and there are all these languages combined together to actually create a proper artwork that is uh, um, good and actually looks uh, really amazing and artists have to learn all those languages in essence to create those artworks and ai just works on a prompt basis so it doesn't know the language of lighting doesn't know the, all the languages that artists have to learn and of course the inherent reliance on training where this is a, a big problem too so information accumulated by a single human within a lifetime cannot be understood and reproduced by ai and uh, i can explain you why this happens uh, simply because like we have multiple senses as human beings and when we compute information regardless of the type of information we're trying to compute at that time we will basically have different thought processes that will kind of like go together so you will experience smell taste you know vision uh, and so on and so forth touch etc so you we have all that experience that we go through it in a in a feeling manner so we got emotion we have logic as well and all those things are building us as humans and create that experience for ourselves and perception is different between humans so ai would not be able to perceive things differently than another person uh, and so on and so forth so that is a big uh, big problem and that becomes basically the human component that cannot be reproduced on the other part here when it comes to like legal and copyright and where and accountability so on the legal and copyright side we have the intellectual property component where AI models are often trained on copyrighted images and that creates a huge ruckus for them so it creates issues um, nonprofits are selling AI tools uh, they can train models under fair use laws but can also share data sets with their sponsors and generally uh, offer AI tools at a cost uh, they need for in-house uh, the need for in-house tools so you just may choose this route to protect confidential and IP data so most in most cases like this one specifically where it's required to have an in-house tool more than a, than a public tool is basically that studios will want to protect their data and IP rather than actually putting it out there and not protecting it and same thing will probably go to artists as well now when it comes to like the unclear whether AI art can be copyrighted um, human altered AI works could potentially be copyrighted example in the US may be considered derivative works if they have sufficient amount of alterations and I was talking here about the alteration component of it earlier that that can happen on the accountability side uh, humans can be held accountable AI cannot so people can be held accountable if they take solutions from other slash proprietary sources and let's say if you take someone else's solution without their consent that is maybe used at scale in certain scenarios, it might not be the, uh, the the best thing because you might be sued. So accountability for humans is way, way higher than the uh, the AI tools or even companies at this point that are using this, uh, these AI technologies. But of course, people are not going after the technology itself. They're going after the people that are building that technology. Humans can be sued, AI cannot. As I said, AI developers will tend to decline responsibility uh, though regulation will likely push towards it meaning that uh, people that develop AI tools uh, will probably try to like go away from responsibility and kind of like hey maybe you know like we don't want to take responsibility over this so it, it becomes the responsibility of the end user how it uses those uh, that, that type of content and they can stipulate that to their their agreements and of course like uh, the government will push them to actually take responsibility because it's a tool that they put on the market uh, and so on and so forth Companies will likely be held responsible by people. So we saw this with what happened with Magic the Gathering. I actually saw an interview of uh, Dave Raposa discussing about it. It was a pretty good interview about the AI technology. And he was talking about the fact that he leaves Magic the Gathering simply because of the um, legal uh, aspects of it and what they do to uh, what, what they did basically by telling the public that they didn't use AI at the beginning. And of course, accountability between companies and vendors this will likely have contractual clauses to ensure protection of copyrighted information given by vendors towards companies. This is very important because it happens all the time. Like even outsourced companies and uh, that actually work for uh, parent companies like bigger companies, uh, those are vendors. And the parent company basically is the, the main company that actually contracts the vendor and those will be put in place. Um, now, let's go to the next part here, which is air regulation and air regulation in general is still in the early phases uh, today around the world there are many challenges and questions may 
that may not be solved soon enough, including the situation of AI-generated art in particular. And uh, these are things that are still concerning us today. And these are things that will be solved probably over time. The problem with government is they don't have, um, let's say, the, the, a clear time frame like how they're going to solve this. And the AI companies are trying to push the boundaries even more to evolve faster because like the regulation doesn't, the regulation kind of chases them and they, they just want to, you know, keep in the front. So they're not uh, stopped into like uh, not, not, not doing that development in itself. Now, US is uh, in the planning phase. So working papers outline steps to be taken regarding AI evaluations for safety and security. Concerns include lack of enforceability and binding measures and the focus on large corporation versus smaller companies. The uh, European Union has a final draft. The EU AI Act was provisionally agreed between the EU Parliament and the Council on 8th of December 2023 to be finalized and adopted. AI systems are divided into four risk levels from unacceptable, which is prohibited, to minimal, unregulated, where most of the general public AI are classified. Uh, copyright lawsuits, USA and EU, and here we have the Anderson, McKernan, and Ortiz versus Midjourney, DeviantArt, uh, DreamUp, and Stability AI, which was uh, amended, sued for using copyrighted artworks to train AI models. Uh, this happened in January 23. Uh, McKernan and Ortiz uh, artworks were not registered for copyright, but Anderson was allowed to amend her case versus Stability AI and was joined by seven more artists, including Greg Rutkowski. Um, Getty Images versus Stability AI. Getty Images is a huge website, uh, as you guys probably know. Uh, this will proceed to UK trial. This was sued in the USA and UK for using over 12 million copyrighted photos and the case can proceed to trial in the UK. Now there's the Thaler versus US Copyright Office, AR denied copyright registration which this was very important, very interesting. US courts will, uh, actually rejected the copyright registration for a generative AI art on the basis that human authorship is a bedrock requirement of copyright. Uh, Thaler intends to contest, but I don't think it will be accepted because again, that is kind of the case. You can only copyright something if it belongs to you, if the creation is yours. It, otherwise, it cannot. Now, let's go to the next part where uh, AI art will actually lack specificity. And of course, like when it comes to like general prompts, uh, this is what AI does. You have the prompt, boom, 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 you get variation. So each outcome is different slightly. And of course, I know there, there are tools out there that you have a slight variation or not, but at the end of the day, whatever tool you're going to use, it will still lack specificity for the product or for the component of the product that you actually need to work for. And actual projects are specific. And this is what happens here. So this is the individual, the artist. And basically, the artist goes through an evaluation process, goes through a feedback loop, uh, with the content that they have to produce to actually generate something that is usable for the product itself that is actually hired for. And the artist here uh, functions very different than uh, AI tool. They have a practical experience from prior product development and intuitive based learning, which happens a lot on art. And uh, unfortunately, that is probably a, a, a good thing because like most artists will actually understand art in that way. They, they learn these, uh, this, this language of creating and they use each tool as a language separate to creating that uh, specific thing. They have brief specifics and mood boards. They have a synthesis pro process. So they synthesize information that is in front of them. They pick and choose whatever they think is fit for the product and for the project. And that happens probably in a snap of time. Right? They think, they process, they synthesize, they extract, and then they create work that is relevant for the project specs, which the AI does not. Now, even if the artist would work, uh, let's say, would, would actually have these, uh, these variants and these variants will be sent to AI, like image to image, for example, even that will not be the intended result. So artists will still have to work on top of it, maybe do changes to actually get to a, a different different result as a called, a so to called the final result. Now, the human creator follows an established flow and pipeline based on their practical experience. Each iteration produced comes closer to the project specifics until they are usable and relevant. So we don't know how machine human interfaces and tools will evolve. And that is a, a, a simple fact specificity might be addressed by experts. And uh, that's why I strongly believe that artists should actually learn more so they become 
more capable and have more expertise over time because regardless of what's going on you will still need people uh, behind these type of products that are being created because people can be held accountable AI yeah, cannot at the end of the day and people do sign contracts AI yeah, cannot sign a contract and even if you work let's say as a freelance for example for a different company if you actually abuse let's say a tool or whatever you do you'll still be sued for abusing that tool because someone actually uh, um, uh, kind of called them out and they outsourced you and you can actually be held liable through contractual agreements. Um, AI might become a part of the pipeline, meaning replacing references, serving as inspiration, iteration, automating repetitive tasks, etc., or in building upon existing IPs, especially where consistency is required, for example, comic book uh, covers. So there's definitely like a, a an area where even this uh, these type of tools and if they become part of the pipeline, they can uh, that can happen but at the same time it will serve probably a totally different purpose i think it's, it's still going to be a, a sort of a tool than, than anything else now what is involved in making art so in in this case scenario we have ai uh, that this is basically ai I put it put it here like that because it's a general ai that is generating images but what it needs is all these other components here that I laid out, meaning for AI to start producing relevant and usable art able to replace the human artist must integrate the following things. And game engine mathematics and game engine uh, type of tools, meaning lighting based on physics, all that stuff for accurate effects based on known physics, lighting, etc. This is a very large number of variables based on known physics that we have today. So that has to be uh, a sort of engine type of thing. Now you have stylistic language, which is a personal choice of the artist usually, which has, again, uh, an infinite number of variables. Like uh, if you only think about like the scale of a head in an artwork uh, to build a stylistic language, that will have uh, a lot of variations. And that's just a head for a character. We're not speaking about multiple types of artworks with different types of variables. And that's an infinite number of variations. Uh, you have the area of workflows, pipelines, development situations and uh, these need to be adapted to each individual production itself example it's either a video game a film a certain type of product that requires like visual information it will still have a infinite number of variable for example it can be 2d 3d 2.5d different grain types uh, different mechanics it, 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 there's a lot of stuff going on here so yeah that will create like a a lot of possibilities you have the consumer needs for example, which I don't think people are taking this in account too much, where uh, from an artistic or entertainment standpoint, uh, people change. Like if today I like something, tomorrow I like something else because they consume content and they kind of move on to the next thing. Um, and of course the human creativity expressed in a mathematical way, which is impossible to create. Like it's, it's actually impossible and that is the human component in itself. And people are creative and capable of, of finding solutions that uh, otherwise they wouldn't be found. And we definitely see that uh, even today. Um, and here there's a, this interesting quote where people aren't buying art, they're buying this idea of what you could be. Uh, if you remove the individual, then that art is uh, cheap because they're not there to tell you why it matters or what it meant to them. So this was said by Dave Raposa, which was very well put, I, th I thought, at the interview that he had um, on, on a podcast. It was, uh, was quite enlightening in a way that uh, you basically, when you buy an artwork or when you participate at a product, your participation is creating a human experience there, which is uh, not, uh, not something that can be taken lightly. And here at the bottom, what we have is basically we have stylistic language, which is X, let's put it like that, plus math variables, which is plus infinite, equals art that is infinite. So you have an infinite number of stylistic languages based on math variables creates infinite number of possibilities. And this is this is impossible to achieve at the current state of affairs. And I don't think it's gonna be achieved in this uh, uh, in the next 10 years, I, I believe. Like I don't think the infinity of the possibilities because of the computing power and many other aspects. And only if this here is solved, it can may maybe create a tool that is proficient to completely replace the human artist but a human component is irreplaceable even if this is done. Now, human art involves an infinite number of possibilities and variables to take into account, which I cannot reproduce at the moment. It's limited by the current computational power and, of course, many other aspects that I talked earlier. Um, and there's an important note to take here. We don't know how the technical capabilities of AI will evolve, of course. 
These are our thoughts based on the current state of, of, of the industry and what we know today. Let's see now the next section where we talk about the creators and the consumers of art and some possibilities that we actually, you know, kind of like ping ponged in terms of ideas and discussed. Um, you have the professional art creators, which uh, might not be considered or needed as much if companies embrace it as, uh, as a quick and cheap fix. So this can be a possibility, but I don't believe it uh, to be like a clear possibility simply because, as I explained earlier, uh, companies will still need to hold some people accountable for what they produce. Therefore, uh, the cheap fix is not going to work because consumers will tend to actually get tired maybe of that. And we'll get into that as well. There might need to retreat into niches, meaning handcrafted versus mass produced, essentially reducing their contribution to their industry, their leverage and their pay. So this this might happen too, like meaning artists will have to be more creative for themselves and actually create a niche of their own more and actually propel that niche of their, their own to actually make it make it different so different that it creates them revenue and uh, it might find it harder to become independent artist when competing with average users of ai this might seem daunting but i i strongly believe that the average users of ai even if they know how to use it they will still don't know how to complete uh, an image that is usable for a product that is very hard for me to understand there, if there will be requirements, there will definitely need people that can actually alter things to an extent that they understand things pretty well to create those things for a product. And when it comes to art consumers, they might consider the content good enough and not perceiving the flaws in AI art or not knowing the rules of art. So when it comes to consumers, consumers are like, oh, look at that. I see a pretty picture. Cool. But consumers are not in the, in the games and films industry. Consumers are not buying pretty pictures they're buying products that require very specific things. So at the end of the day, I even if the consumers might consider the content good enough, that that can be a possibility, I don't think it's likely. They might become fatigued by a flood of AI art and become less interested in digital art and oh, art overall, which actually, like if you think about last year, there was a huge flood of AI art in the, in the market and that, you know, was done by a lot of normal people that are not artists in themselves. Um, and of course, like if you think about the, the the flood of images that were done with AI, even if that was the case, uh, a, a lot of companies, you know, didn't didn't actually bulge or like consumers didn't want to like buy a whole ton of AI art in itself. Um, and again, we don't know how this is going to go, but this is a possibility. They might return to appreciate human made art, acknowledging its intrinsic uniqueness and the person or individual uh, behind it. Now. <clears throat> The advantages and main differences between creative professional and average user, users of AI is their perseverance in improving through a solid learning process and their passion for creating and for the creative process itself, which a average user of AI does not have. Uh, this builds a knowledge and experience that average AI users lack. Even when AI works perfectly, the quality of the outputs is only as high as the quality of the inputs. Without knowledge and experience, it is improbable to create high quality art. And that is a, a pretty, pretty interesting factual information. You might create some cool art, but you not have that intrinsic experience of creating a stellar art based on your understanding of the, the world itself. And there's another area here that I believe is important. Humanity is constantly evolving. Things that seem to be a trend today may fade out eventually and leave space to something new. Uh, the same as artistic currents of art periods change over time. So that if we think about like what happened in uh, let's say in impressionism that was a, a trend at one point it actually became a current an artistic current then you had like pop art that was a current then you had like so you see in art you have all these artistic currents that become trends at one point and they kind of like disappear and something new appears this is always the case like if uh, 20 years ago the entertainment industry was barely developing 3d now 3d is very mainstream and it's there uh, if uh, like there are certain tools that were like the first animations done by Disney, now animations uh, are looking very different and you can check out the League of Legends animations that were done, totally different ball game altogether. And everything that I'm talking about here is basically humanity will evolve and constantly change and we can expect change to be continuing. Uh, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go away. Now let's go into some things related to individuals and practical uh, steps. And of course, like to, to level up your skill set, you probably already know this. So if you're doing art for a living, try to become a high level expert in your field. Meaning that if you, you go through the process of being a specialist, 
you go then to be an expert in your field. And after you become an expert, you then become a, you go specialize in a different thing and you, then you become a generalist. So you generalize to become a more proficient, more capable. Uh, even skills such as uh, understanding like how you can actually solve problems, different scenarios, it can be very beneficial in the long run. And experts will still be needed to curate and correct words, whether human or AI created. Uh, it's important to aim high beyond what you think you're capable of. So even if you fall short of, of, of the current goal, you will reach higher than you will if you aim for the midfield. And remember, even if you have a client and you work with AI, you are responsible for the artwork you deliver at the end of the day because the client will sue you, not the AI work you did. AI does not have accountability or responsibility towards the thing it produced, while companies pay for accountability and responsibility, and that's why they contract people. Um, here, you have to integrate other skills um, if the world is changing fast, we have to adapt fast as well. One uh, way of staying relevant is adding new skills, including interpersonal skills. These require like interpersonal skills. Here I'm speaking more about uh, things such as communication, uh, capable of giving feedback, uh, having a, a good conversation, a good debate. Regardless of your line of work, you will need to be highly capable uh, in, the inter, um, in this uh, interpersonal skill set. Now, there's another area here. Be aware when posting online. So whatever you do, wherever you post, you need to understand the uh, TOS, like the terms of service of each website, uh, where you post your art and understand how your data can be used, including by third parties. You can build your own portfolio website for more control, of course, but remember that uh, that's, that's what it is. Uh, remember that whatever you do, if your art is online, it may still be using training data sets as it may be scrapped from, from, from searches, indices, or even other websites. Um, Copyright your name and artworks like there's there's definitely a way you can register that, you know, there, there, of course, there are fees involved and we recommend contracting a law firm that specializes in copyright law as suggested by the lawsuits against AI companies. This adds another layer of protection. So it's definitely something useful that you can consider by copywriting your name and of course your artworks. Uh, focus on what you know. So AI technology and regulation are still developing. There are many unknowns regarding its potential and its possible uses in the future, which can trigger anxiety and demotivation. Focus on what you do know and at the moment and what you can do to improve yourself. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay updated. Check our video description for more resources, including courses, tips, feedback, and a lively community on Discord. I'll see you there.